Driving every corner of our global economy is code. I'm John Shuchuk, technical fellow at Microsoft. In this series, we look under the hood at today's most dynamic open source software with the people behind it. This is Decoded. Welcome to Boulder, where the Rocky Mountains meet the Great Plains. Boulder embodies the true spirit of a cooperative community. So we thought, what better place than here to talk about DevOps, the practice of two communities, developers and IT pros coming together to create the next generation of applications. The DevOps movement is centered around automation. It's about bringing together developers, QA, and ops. Let's say hello to one of the key leaders of the DevOps movement, CTO and founder of Deus, Gabriel Monroy. Hey John, welcome to Boulder. Now the model that you kind of think about when you're building these solutions, how do you think about the process of the developers integrating with the QA? Are there some key principles? Yeah, the most important is to allow developers to do what they do best, which is write code and to allow operations to do what they do best, which is manage things like deployments, monitoring, stuff like that. So at the end of the day, this is about figuring out how we can best collaborate um, while letting people still do what they're good at. And speaking of that, I think there's a place in town we should go check out. It's interesting, this was a joint development effort between our sister city of Dushanbe, Tajikistan, and Boulder. They put 40 artisans to work assembling this gorgeous building, and in return, we sent them an internet cafe that's sitting in, uh, in Dushanbe. Well, let's grab a table and let's write some code. Let's do it. So what we've got here is a bot. That's kind of this hot thing that a lot of people are building these these agents that can be in Slack, they can be in Skype, that interact um, with the users. If you look at the code here, it's actually pretty simple. We're just creating a Restify server like we did last time, and we're gonna be listening to a set of messages that are coming in, and when they come in, we're gonna respond. So we've got a microservice, a bot microservice that's connected into a whole bunch of other services. Make sense? Very cool, yeah. It's actually gonna turn around and use another service, the meme gen. There's not too much complexity here. Once we've got the meme and we've created the request, we're gonna send it back to the user so that they can see it. So I'll just put a little code in here. Hi there, let's save that and let's actually see this in action. Just like last time in the show, we've connected up GitHub uh, to Azure websites. And so when I do a git push out to GitHub, Azure is gonna automatically pick up these changes and deploy it. So let me just show you that in action. We'll do a git push up to decoded. Azure is listening to events at GitHub and it's pulling that code in and it's automatically deploying it. That's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, this kind of tooling didn't exist even just a few years ago. And it's really kind of our first entree now into how DevOps is gonna work. Let's go over here to Slack and let's actually go talk to it. It's gonna go do this query to the meme generation site. Now, Doge is one of the common ones. Let me just pop that in here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have that Doge and we're gonna say, ask me about it one more time, I dare ya. <laughs> Sound good? Sounds good. So let's, let's see. see that in action. There we go. <laughs> this is pretty wild. Like there wasn't a lot of code in the application that you showed me, and yet here is the app like interacting with Slack and interacting with you know a meme service. How does this how does this all work? We've got this microservice, which is the actual conversational pattern that the bot does. But what we also have around it are a whole collection of other services. For example, the thing that's generating the image. If you were to go up to dev.botframework.com, there's a little control panel up there. And as you can see, there's our Azure website that we're deploying to. Here, we've got it configured to Slack as one of the things that we can have a conversation with. By putting these things all together, we've got this collection of cooperating microservices that give us funny pictures. 
you got your career started in DevOps on the ops side of the house, is that right? Back during that time, a delivery pipeline for a software application looked something like developers writing software, that moving over to QA to get it tested, and then operations teams drafting run books. Because of the way the process worked, it took forever. Like weeks and months. And there was a lot of finger pointing as to why it was taking so long. Um, and so what, what happened is, you know, a lot of the teams just frankly hated each other. What are we talking about? Yelling, okay. screaming, everything you could imagine. And so I was kind of used as a traitor uh, by some of my ex coworkers in the operations. So no drinks after work anymore? No drinks after work anymore. Yeah, it got pretty bad. So you're writing the software, you're building out some of the tools to help with these challenges. Now you need to get investors. How'd that go? Not great. Um, at, when you're trying to build software for other software companies, we found that you know, it was really tough to A, get meetings with investors, um, but once we got the meetings, it was really hard to you know, describe exactly what we were doing and why it was valuable. So we were just going from meeting to meeting to meeting and just completely flopping. It was a, it was a big problem. So how'd you break through? At the end of the day, it ended up being more about trust in us, uh, you know, the founding team of the company, rather than you know, understanding of the technology. So over the last couple episodes of Decoded, we've been building to microservices using web technologies, Node, TypeScript. What should somebody start thinking about as they're moving to a modern DevOps world? Git and GitHub make great source control tools. Tying that together with Mocha and Chai if you're in the JavaScript world for testing. Bridging that all together with Travis CI, which can integrate all those testings on commit. And then building Docker images as artifacts at the end of the pipeline. Why don't we go get that working? Let's do it. So we've just push this up to GitHub, and now we want to have that continuous integration from Travis happen. Tell us a little bit about what's going on here with Travis. So Travis is you know, one of the leading hosted uh, services for continuous integration. It's actually really easy to use. You write a, a file uh, that describes how you want Travis to be configured, drop it into your repository, and uh, commit it. From that point, you can configure Travis to run your tests and even deploy your code. You notice that Travis has been watching what we've done, and it's gone off and it's built that, and it's even notified us in Slack. You're seeing a lot of this kind of stuff out yeah, there. Yeah, we refer to this in the industry as chat ops. Chat and chat systems like Slack are where uh, you know developers and, and operations folks tend to live. And so having the notifications come to you is a lot more effective than you having to go to them. One of the new trends in sort of the world of DevOps has been the uh, introduction of container technology. And what containers allow you to do is they allow you to package up your application along with the runtime environment that it depends on. That allows you to then you know build that on your laptop and then move it to another system where you can test it and then move that same artifacts into production. So you have a really strong guarantee that the code that worked in one place is going to actually work in another. There really has become this kind of singularity in the industry now with Docker. That's right. And Docker is cool because it lets us package this artifact up and then run it in a lot of different places. Container technology has been around for you know many, many years. What Docker did is they managed to make this really, really easy to use so that average developers everywhere, you know, whether they're working on Linux and open source systems or in the world of Microsoft and .NET, all the libraries and all the things that are, all the dependencies, they all get bundled into that container image. So regardless of whether the underlying system it's running on is a Windows server or a Linux server, or in the cloud, in the on cloud, on-prem, on -prem, you know, on a laptop. I mean, it really doesn't matter because the container has everything that that source code needs in order to run. So it would be pretty cool if we could take this microservice and package it up as a Docker image. That would be cool. We've been actually working on this pretty neat open source framework called Start.js. All it lets you do is take any Node project and with a quick command line command, create a Docker file. So here's that open source project called Start.js. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say build and we're gonna pass down the path to this text meme bot that we've been building. And we're gonna give it the name Decoded Show. And that is that. Notice Docker file has been written and it's off building the Docker image. If we go back to the source code, this probably looks pretty familiar to you. What do we got going on here? Sure, so what this is doing is it's uh, importing from the Docker Hub node uh, project, which is a sort of a node runtime environment that the community's curated. It's adding the source code into a, a particular directory, exposing a port, and then running the application. I mean, there isn't a whole lot here, but if you're not familiar with Docker, I can definitely see why a tool like Start.js would be a you know, real good uh, way to accelerate your, your journey. If you're a node developer building things the way we've described over the past couple of episodes, here and decoded. Now you've got a trivial way to get your stuff packaged up and ready for DevOps. 
So what's it going to take to turn this into a production system? Well, when you think about a production grade system, one of the first things that comes to mind is getting the reliability to a place where failures in the underlying infrastructure aren't gonna impact your mm -hmm. application. The second bit is you're gonna need to make sure that scalability can be achieved. And you know, a lot of these applications are gonna you know, demand millions and millions of users, and you need to make sure that you can scale out horizontally uh, in order to support that demand. Now, what's the role that Diaz plays in all this? We're really focused on the developer experience part of the equation here. Diaz is actually built on a, a technology called Kubernetes, which is a cluster manager. And Kubernetes is great because it deals in the concept of uh, defining desired state. And then what Kubernetes will do is we'll run a control loop that will reconcile what the desired state is with what the current <laughs> state is. And it will make sure that the, it's you're always driving towards the So it's a metadata-driven... It's a metadata-driven approach that's always driving things towards the desired state in the environment. The problem with this is that developers don't actually think in terms of these kind of desired state manifests. Um, they think in terms of, I want to do, you know, I want to scale this up to four, I want to deploy this new version of code. We're a little bit this torque converter between this world of, you know, desired state as managed by Kubernetes um, and the imperative user experience that developers really want to have. So you're the expert at Deus. Let's see this in action now. All right, let's do it. We need to start thinking about, well, there's going to be millions of people who might be accessing this thing. So we're going to need this, this to run on a production grade cluster and it's reliable and you know, it's going to be able to allow us to scale this app out. If we hop over here, there is a Travis.yaml file here, which describes kind of what we've changed uh, in terms of the build to actually integrate this with the Deus cluster. We're also now logging into Docker, building the Docker image from the Docker file that was created by Start.js, tagging and pushing that Docker image up to a publicly accessible place, and then running this Docker deploy command. So where is this going? Do we have a set of machines set up? Rita from the Dakota team uh, worked with me to set up a Deus cluster running on Azure that allows us to sort of have an environment where we can run and orchestrate uh, these Docker containers at scale um, and have it be extremely reliable. Can we see it in action? Yeah, let's do that. So let's flip over to a terminal here. One of the things we can do is we can scale this thing up to four containers. And I can just type in day of scale, web equals four. So that's going to take that Docker image. It's going to replicate it out. It's going to hook it up to the front end. So you can see it only took us 12 seconds to get to that point. Now, suppose I had introduced like a bug or something in here. What would we do? How would we manage that in a production environment? If the bug was introduced at the software layer, hopefully the tests would have caught that. Yep. However, if the bug was a little little bit more subtle, the test might not have caught it, and there's a chance for the Deus orchestration layer to actually catch that the web server maybe didn't come up healthy, in which case um, that's going to protect you um, here. But another class of failure you need to worry about are things like servers going down, you know, servers in your cluster, or maybe containers failing for, for unknown reasons, out of memory errors, or uh, problems with uh, interactions with other processes on a system. One of the beauties of Deus is that it's actually a, a self-healing system, so it can detect any uh, you know problems and it will always make sure that there are four or 10 or a thousand of these containers running at any time. One of the things that you and I've talked about is that as we move into the next chapter of the DevOps world, we're gonna wanna be able to run often different versions. Right now I'm saying scale web equals four. Um, in the future I wanna say scale to whatever based on these memory and CPU limits. Awesome. So that's something that's gonna be landing soon. But you know, another thing related to what you're talking about is the concept of canary deployments. Um, and, and the name comes from canary in the coal mine. So if you have a version of a deployment that uh, you can put out there and maybe send five or 10% of your traffic to, if that deployment has any problems, you can you know determine you know that you need to roll that back. So how do you do something like a rollback? We'll type in Deus releases, and, and you can see that we maintain an append-only ledger of every change that's made to any application. And what we can do is, I'll go ahead and roll back to version 41, we're currently on version 44. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna orchestrate a zero downtime rollback wow. of, of this application um, and all the containers on your behalf. DevOps is you know, definitely about collaboration between developers and operators, but one of the best ways that you can collaborate is by defining a clear API um, between how the groups are gonna interact. And if you think about the Deus APIs that the cluster exposes, um, that's really a way of codifying um, the type of interactions that the operations team wants uh, you know, to, to expose to, to the developers as consumers. Now we have this thing running up on Azure. Somebody could deploy this across multiple clouds. They could deploy it on-prem. We have uh, users who are running this at 
scale on bare metal, on clouds like Azure, uh, and you know even uh, on a laptop. So it really is allowing you to leverage the portability of something like Docker and run this alongside things like databases and other backing services really anywhere you want. With the advent of technologies like Docker, Deus, Azure, there's really never been a better time to be a developer. Well, this has been incredibly fun. I really enjoyed putting this app together with you. Thanks for doing this. Likewise. As I think about the future, I think it makes a lot of sense to consider the possibility of what a fly-by-wire infrastructure might look like, where developers are committing code and everything from you know, the testing and, and deployment uh, through canaries of that code, you're completely 100% automated. So I'm really hoping that the tooling and automation can get sufficiently advanced that developers don't have to think about anything beyond you know, writing code. They can really innovate at the speed of thought. Stay tuned as we look at all aspects of application architecture. We'll share the best practices and continue the conversations with the industry's key players next time on Decoded.